Hey everybody, and welcome back to the vlog. Well, we're gonna we're gonna pick up where we left off on uh, on our last video about the triple murder case and how, and how how it has so many twists and turns, ups and downs. You're not gonna believe what's coming next, you know. But before we get into that, my beautiful daughter read the article about this story that was featured in the March 1996 issue of Penthouse Magazine. So um, I'll give my little, two, put my little two cents in. Uh, and then we're gonna get to the murder. How it happened, when it happened, the whole nine yards. And this is a, this is a huge story because this story took four years. Well, actually more, it, it took from 19, from, from 1975 to uh, uh, 1979. And everything that was going on in, in this case is unbelievable. And we even have a supernatural side of the story. For all you people that believe in ghosts and stuff like that, man, I'm gonna tell the story at the very end, that's gonna raise the hair on the back of your neck. And it's the type of story that didn't come from me. It, it, it came from the owner of 24 Stanford Road. See, it was a very little house, a small house. And when Brian finally did get out to get around sleeping with Alice, he had this little extension here built on. And that's which he lived and her window was right. No, that was my window. That was uh, when I lived there, that was my window. A window you can't see because of the trees. But this photo was also in my book. So my beautiful daughter Kaylee is gonna pick up where she left off about the, about the story and how it, how it appeared in the March 1996 issue of Penthouse Magazine. Thank you, Kaylee. The conversation with Doherty and Sullivan played out over and over in Mara's head. Sure, he owed Doherty a great deal, but not this. What have I agreed to do? The guy whacked 15 people and they want me to F his wife? Are they crazy? Am I crazy? Mara parked in the driveway of 24 Sanford Road and entered the house. Alice, as always, was happy to see him. I hope you're staying for a couple days, Alice trilled. She hugged him tightly. Alice, Mara began. Brian thought it might be a good idea if I moved in until he got out. Beth entered the room. Did you hear that, Beth? Alice bubbled. Kevin is going to live with us for a while. Isn't that wonderful? Beth and Beth smiled and locked eyes with Mar. Yes, that's wonderful. And so it was that in August 1975, Mar took up residence at 24 Sanford Road. From the moment Mar moved into the house, he was strangely paralyzed by fear, by uncertainty by the moral implications of it all. As each day went by, Mar grew more fond of Beth Escher, and Beth Escher's feelings for Mar seemed to intensify. She had gone from eye contact to body contact, brushing against him often, touching him when they talked. There was an undeniable attraction between them, but more than that, they were primal urges. Mar was a young man who had spent four years in prison. Beth was a young woman with a long absent husband. Maybe both of them could control their emotions, but Mar wondered how long it would they would control their FTX school appetites. At first, Mar was able to keep his desires under control, not by any conscious effort, but because of the situation. Every time his desire for Beth overtook him, an equally powerful guilt shook him free of the longing. And there was the fear. What would a hitman do to someone who was screwing his wife? One guess. Beth, Mar said one afternoon, I want to talk to you about something. Beth frowned. She had never seen Mar look so serious. Sure, Kevin. Beth, why are you protecting Robert? What do you mean? The tape. That's what I mean. Beth paled. What tape? Come on, Beth. You know what tape. Beth stared at Mar for a long moment. Her eyes reflected confusion, uncertainty, mistrust. How do you know about the tape? I overheard you tell Robert on the phone that the tape was safe. Mar hadn't heard, overheard anything, but he was gambling that Beth had indeed mentioned the tape in a phone 
conversation. Okay, so let me let me stop and explain what the tape meant. Now here we go into another another story. That has to do with the Hodge murder. Robert Escher secretly taped Donna Hodge, the woman who wound up murdering her husband on West End Avenue in 1973. So that's what the tape is. So what, what he did was he spoke about what they were going to do, the conspiracy to murder her husband, got her on tape. And once the, the murder was, was um, committed, he showed her the tape and said, if you ever rat me out, there was like, there was another guy, Hodge. If you ever rat me out, this tape will come and you'll go with me. So that's what the tape was. All right, you want to finish, honey? Yes. No, no. In a phone conversation, or if she had it, would it remember that she had it? Beth stared away, her mind reeling back through the dozens of phone calls from Escher. Then she looked at Mar. He's my husband. Yes, he is. And he's also Bobby's father. Mar leaned in on Beth. Do you want little Bobby raised by a murderer? Robert is not a murderer. He's innocent. Have you listened to the tape? No. Why not? It's none of my business. Mar pressed. Maybe you're afraid of what you'll hear. Mm. Beth crossed her arms. I don't want to talk about it. I think you should go to the district attorney and tell them everything you know. Mar braced for a tirade. Instead, Beth grew very sad. She stood and walked quickly up the stairs. Mar thought about Beth's initial reaction, a woman defending her husband. But now there was something more powerful going on in Beth's mind, something more primal. Beth Escher was also a mother thinking about the welfare of her child. The following morning, Beth seemed to have forgotten the conversation. She was full of energy, chirpy. She fed Bobby breakfast, then left to take him to nursery school. Alice also left. Now alone, Mar walked slowly and deliberately through the house. Where would Beth hide the tape? Mar decided the first place to look was a large credenza where Beth was always stuffing things, recipes, magazines, coupons, he knelt down and carefully sorted through it. A hair ribbon, a scarf, a catalog, a tape. Mar ran to a wall unit, popped the tape into a tape deck. He pressed the play button and heard a man's voice, then a woman's voice. They were planning a murder. Mar walked up to Darty's desk and handed him a cassette. Darty looked at it. The Rolling Stones? It was the first step. It was the first tape I came across. And I wanted to copy it before Beth got back from nursery school. Darity shot to his feet. This is the Escher tape? That's the Escher tape. On the drive back to Fairlawn, Mar resolved to move out of the house. He had accomplished the mission, so why stay? He could only think of reasons not to stay. One, he was falling in love with Beth. Two, Beth's husband was a remorseless killer. Three, Beth had a kid. As much as he loved little Bobby, Mar didn't want to get involved with a woman who had a kid. Hell, he was just a kid himself. Mar walked into the house and found Beth sitting in the living room. From the look on her face, it was obvious she had something to say. Mar stiffened. Had Beth somehow figured out that he had copied the tape? I went to Rikers this afternoon to visit Robert, Beth said. I was telling Robert all about you, Mar swallowed. About me? Yes. Over the last few visits, I've been telling him how much I like you, how fond of you I am. Mar frowned. He couldn't really be hearing this. So today I told Robert that I was attracted to you, physically attracted. Mar looked at Beth in horror. And what did he say when you told him that? He said he wants to see you. Mm. Mar climbed behind the wheel of Alice's brand new ivory colored 1976 Chevrolet Malibu Classic. Beth slid into the passenger seat. The 45 minute trip to Rikers Island was mostly silent. Then again, what was there to say? Robert Escher, killer for hire wanted to have a conversation with Kevin Marr, who had already seen more trouble than he ever expected. He imagined what the meeting would be like. Escher, you effed my wife, Marr. No, I didn't, I swear I didn't. Escher, you thought about doing it, didn't you? Marr, okay, maybe I thought about it. Escher, you're a dead man, kid, a dead man. This is what I'm thinking. Kevin, Beth said, are you all right? Marr snapped back to reality. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. A few now, minutes later. Now, now, don't forget, I'm only 21 years old. <laughs> and this guy at the time, well, he was born in, he was born in 1940. 
So he was 40, 50, 60, 70. He was 35 years old at that time. At this at that time. He was he had 14 years old anyway. But um okay, so, so go ahead. A few minutes later, Mar entered the Rikers Island Hospital Ward where Escher was taking some medical tests. He was led to the visitor's area, which consisted of five cubicles divided by glass. He took a seat in a cubicle and stared at the empty chair on the other side of the glass. Then Escher appeared, took a seat, and peered through the glass at him. His eyes were cold and emotionless. So you're Kevin, Escher said evenly. His icy gaze moved slowly over Mar's body. Mar started to say something, but he couldn't speak. Escher continued, measuring his words. Yes. Beth has told me quite a lot about you, and every time I call the house and talk to Bobby, he's always saying, Kevin did, Kevin and I did this, Kevin and I did that. Mar slumped a little. He not only thinks I've stolen his wife, he thinks I've stolen his kid. Bobby's a great kid, Mar finally managed. Yeah, Eshert smiled. He's a great kid. Eshert looked away for a long moment, then snapped his head back toward Mar. I'm in jail, Eshert said. And you know the worst thing, the worst thing that could happen to a man in jail? Mar knew the answer, but wasn't about to say it. He waited for Eshert to speak. Somebody effing his wife. Escher finally sneered. Mar's, Mar's heart started to pound. Escher is going to have me killed. Yeah, Mar blur blurted. I know what you mean. I was in jail once and found out somebody was effing my girlfriend. Mar laughed nervously. Escher did not seem amused. What do you think of Beth? Escher asked. Mar chose his words very carefully. She's very nice. You think she's attractive? Escher pressed. Mar held his breath. What am I supposed to say? How am I supposed to tell him that his wife is unattractive and piss him off? Or how am I supposed to say his wife is attractive and have him put an effing contract out for my life? Beth is a very attractive woman, Mark said. Escher smiled. Beth is a beautiful woman, and you know what else she is? She's human, flesh and blood. She has desires. Escher leaned close to the glass. She tells me she's attracted to you. Are you attracted to her? Mark felt like he was being maneuvered into a confession. It reminded him of an interrogation by cops in which they asked a series of questions that built on one another like a stack of bricks until they walled you in. Mar sat stone-faced. Eschert stared at him. Eschert pressed. Are you attracted to her or not? Sure, Mar said, his voice barely audible. I'm attracted to her. Who wouldn't be? Mar looked directly into Eschert's eyes. This time, he didn't see the coldness. He saw fear. I love Beth, Eschert said. I don't want her running around falling in love with someone. I don't want to lose her. Suddenly, Mar felt sorry for Escher, but the pity was fleeting. He reminded himself that the man on the other side of the glass was a murderer. Let me ask you a question, Escher said. If you find her attractive, how come you never made a move? Mar relaxed a little. At least Escher knew he hadn't slept with Beth. I don't do that kind of thing, Mar insisted. I don't mess with somebody else's woman. Escher smiled. Beth thinks it's because you're afraid of me. Mar shrugged. There was no way he was going to respond to that. He'll never convict me on the murders, Escher stated with arrogance. But I figure I still got to do four years. That's a long time for a woman like Beth to wait. Escher, Escher's gaze dropped to the floor. He grimaced, then slowly raised his eyes. Kevin, I want you to take care of Beth until I get out. Mar frowned. Four years? That's a long time to ask someone to take care of your wife. Escher elaborated. I want you to take care of her needs. Or S E X means. Okay. So now I mean the, these are scenes like even a, a movie script writer couldn't uh, come up with. I'm on the phone with this guy and I'm a young kid and I actually did time in Rikers Island Hospital. I actually I knew all those people still. And uh, it was set up in a way that a bus used to have to take you right to the hospital, right Island Island Hospital. And when you walked in, there was a little, um, I don't know, plaza, like a little plaza, not big at all. And to the right was the visiting room, right? So usually visiting rooms in Rikers Island, House, Brown's House of Detention, Queen's House of Detention. The inmates are on the other side of the wall. There's no way that the visitor and the inmate can come into contact. 
except this setup. I mean, when you go in as an inmate, as I have many times, my mother was there. You, you just, the door is open. There's two doors. The two doors are open that, that, that the visitors and the inmate comes in. And when the, when the hack says it's visits up, boom, you hang up the phone, you get up and you walk towards the door. And he, okay. So that's what happened. It was me and him face to face. Okay, baby, go ahead. Mar gasped. Had he heard correctly? You're a young man, Escher explained. You don't want to get involved with a woman who has kids. And Beth would never fall in love with someone like you. Mar felt vaguely insulted. I would be forever in your debt if you would do this for me until I get out, Escher said. Mar studied Escher. He's asking me to F his wife. Sullivan and Doherty want me to F his wife. You can't make this stuff up. You, you can't make it up. You can't make it up. Guys, in for three murders. You can't, you can't make this up. Hell, everybody wants me to have his wife. Okay, Mara finally- <laughs> Stop right there. Eh. Alan Sullivan, the DA that had the case. Now, let me tell you about Alan Sullivan real quick. Alan Sullivan was the DA that prosecuted, <laughs> I'm so fucking bad with names, uh, John Lennon's murderer. The guy, he shot him in his driveway of his house on Fifth Avenue. Uh, with Hinckley. Was Hinckley was that <laughs> Reagan. I don't know. But anyway, he successfully prosecuted that guy who remains in jail to this day. He's done, I think it was 1980. He's done well over 25 years, but they're never going to let him out because they fear that a Beatles uh, fan will kill him. <laughs> they're never going to let him out. And everybody gets out, but he's never going to get out. He's never going to get out. The son of Sam is never going to get out. And there's a couple of them. But anyway, and and also, and by the way, he is never going to get out. And I'll tell you what happened to him. Go ahead, baby. What else could he say? And you take care of little Bobby for me, will you? Don't worry, Robert. I'll take real good care of Bobby. The visit over, Mar stood and walked toward the elevator. Although it was strictly forbidden for inmates and visitors to come in contact, a guard inadvertently led Escher into the hall way at the same time mar entered the hallway well, now face to face mar and escher stood face to face <laughs> so, i remember it like it was yesterday i can't remember what i had for breakfast this morning i can't remember what happened in 1975 oh, oh fuck. they shook hands and then escher was taken back to his cell mar rejoined beth in the reception area beth smiled everything okay mar shrugged i guess so Mar steered the Malibu out of the parking lot. Okay, stop right here. So now, imagine all the pressure. I got Jim Doherty. I got Alan Sullivan. I got uh, Robert Escher. Uh, Alice, she was trying to push the both of us to hook up. I, I, I mean, I mean, and last but not least, little Bobby. I used to call him the pool bear. He was the cutest kid. And, and he started, as, I guess he, at that age, at, at this time, Eshet had been in jail for two years. He was arrested in Lee, Massachusetts, extradited, extradited to New York, and he had the two cases in Manhattan and Queens. But especially Bobby. <clears throat> I fell in love with him right away. Like right away. Excuse me. Okay, go ahead, baby, read Mar steered the Malibu out of the parking lot and onto 21st Street in Queens. Okay, stop right there. So I leave Rikers Island. I got Alice's brand new 1975 Malibu Classic. And then, so what happens is, after the visit's over, I got to wait for the bus to take me to the, to the front of the prison where you get the Steinway Street bus and it goes over the bridge and then, no, no. I think, you know, there was a parking lot. Just as you come into Rankin's Island, there's a parking lot. Then the bus picks up the visitors and takes them in there. So now, Beth is not, she's on that the reception center, right? In the front gate, as soon as you walk, go into 1414 Asian Street, East Elmhurst, New York, 11370 zip code. I still remember that. I can't remember anybody's name. Oh, another reason. Oh, oh fuck that. You know, imagine I know, remember this damn zip code and Google it if you think I'm wrong. So now I'm like, I'm like, 
what the fuck? I've never in my short 21 years of life, don't forget I did three years in prison uh, from 17 to 20. I mean, I, I was just really kind of, I, I don't know. So I get, uh, now I meet Beth for the first time after I, the husband. She knows what he told me. I didn't even know what he was going to tell me. I, I didn't know what he was going to tell me, but she already knew what he was going to say because she had the telephone call business. Uh, telephone uh, calls with me. So I'm nervous. I, I'm like, my head's spinning. I'm, all these people, everybody wants me to be with her, uh, uh, including a fucking murderer, including him. What the fuck? We never hear a story like that. And, and mentioning great stories. And how come I only got 4,000 freaking subscribers? All you guys push the button. No fucking what, what are you doing? You can't get this story no, nowhere else. So now I'm in the freaking car. And first thing is, is everything. She goes, she goes to me. She goes, is everything okay? And she said, is everything okay? And I said, well, why don't we read it and see what, it, what I said? We already read that. Oh, yeah. She said, everything okay? Marsh drugs, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. So, so now I'm in the car and I drove the car. I wound up on 21st Street because I was going to take the 59th Street Bridge to the, because I didn't, I didn't like paying the damn Tribe Road Bridge tunnel. So I get on, I get on 21st Street. Headed for the 59th Street Bridge, and there's a whole bunch of taxis, taxi cab business, hundreds of taxis all over them, an asshole, and they, they all drive like assholes. So I'm nervous and I'm speeding, and next thing you know, she puts her hand on my leg and she says, Listen, just calm down, and everything is going to be okay. You know? And I'm like freaking sweating, but I don't, I, don't know, I don't know. I never had so many different mixed emotions going on in my head in the same time good, bad, hot, cold, up, down, left, right. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. So, and I drive fast, I always drove fast, but this time my mind wasn't on driving. Because when I was, when the cops would chase me, I, I would have five moves ahead before, and I'm blasting down with this 350 cubic inch 1974. It wasn't, it was a piece of fucking shit, but anyway, I'm going, and here comes this stupid cab driver. He's going towards the story of Park, I'm going towards 59th Street Brick, and he just makes a fucking left right in front of me. And I just went, Whoa! And I T-boned him. The whole front of the car, the hood is bent up. I, I, I had to put the window down. Bang! And I spin him around. Boom! And I keep going up a level of the 5'9 bridge, up over. But now the friggin' car, the hood is, is bent. I have to drive out. I get on the FDR over the, oh, I, I get on, no, what did I do? No, I didn't. I got on the FDR, and the FDR took me over the bridge to the Major Deegan. And I got off 231st Street or 230 to 231st Street, got off, left it, boom, and called. I don't know who I called, and I left the car there. And Alice reported the cost. Uh, I, it's, it's okay. Do you want to finish? It's, so, do you want to finish? It? Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Go ahead. So that Go ahead. night, the patchwork clan made. That night, the patchwork clan made up of Mar, Beth, Bobby, and Alice sat down for dinner. The gather gathering wasn't exactly Father Knows Best, but it had all the warmth of a traditional family. Around nine thirty, Beth tucked Bobby in for the night, and at eleven, Alice went to bed. Then Mar and Beth ended the evening as they always did. They watched the news. Until now, the nightly event was nothing more than what it appeared. Two people sitting in front of a TV set. Mar would comment on a particular news story. Beth would offer her thoughts. But on this night, both Mar and Beth sat rigid, staring straight ahead. When the news ended, Beth stood. Good night, Kevin. Good night, Beth. Beth turned and walked Stop up. right there. So, so I was sleeping on the couch. Beth had her own bedroom. Alice had hers, and little Bobby had his. So while I was staying there, that's what we did. I didn't put the move on her. Uh, so she says, all right, good night. 
And she gets up and she walks up the stairs, halfway up the stairs. Go ahead, finish it. I remember this like it was yesterday. Um, Beth turned and walked upstairs, leaving Mar alone in the living room. It was quiet, the kind of quiet you could hear because it was so quiet. Then Mar heard the creaking of the stairs and looked up. Beth was standing on the landing. She was holding a quilt loosely around her, and she was wearing nothing but a pair of panties. You coming to bed? Beth asked. Okay, so let's stop it right here. So anyway, that's just about the, the end of it anyway, right? So anyway, so that set everything off. And of course, I did go upstairs. And then in the morning, Bobby came in, jumped on the bed, and he hugged me. And he was, uh, uh, and, and also, Ashid had phone calls. He was able to make phone calls from jail. And he would always speak to his son on the phone, like every night or whatever it was and um but bobby was five his father went away at when he was three so he barely remembered him barely so i'm gonna leave <clears throat> this story like this and this this is what's coming now of course on the other video, so I didn't realize that I was going to get into this, but, but anyway, on, on, in the other story, um, everybody in the house is dead. It's March 1979. And so, okay, everybody's thinking, okay, Kevin's going to get the information to put him in prison. He's going to go to prison, end of story, and he died in prison of uh, complications from uh, the AIDS virus. That's how he died. But no, it's not. And um, I'm going to do back-to-back -back videos, but I'm going to end this one on that note. So this is an unbelievable story. That's so unbelievable. No, no screenwriter could make this story up. What happened next? And then what happened the day, the day that I was asked by my first publisher to go over to the house and take a picture of the house so we could put it in the book. And I did. And I took this picture. And you see that Ford station wagon in the driveway? Well, after I took the picture, I knocked on the door. And that guy answered. And what he's about to tell me will absolutely blow your mind, especially if you guys are into supernatural, what do you call it when people are into the ghosts? What do you call it? Paranormal. If you're into any of that stuff, you're not going to want to miss this. Please like, subscribe, and um, I'm going to see you on the next one.